atrema kasa tutu emfashema erade kaso na manyo imaso Good morning and welcome to the word on Asasi Radio 99.5. I am Reverend Ikua. The Bible tells us that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. Therefore, all things must begin with God. And so let us begin this broadcast in the name of God who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. While we prepare our hearts and our minds to receive the word of God, let us listen to some music. They say this mountain can't be moved. They say these chains will never break. Thank you for staying with us and if you just tuned in you are listening to the word on Asasi Radio 99.5 I am Reverend Ikua Yesterday we began to listen to the testimony of Julian Sutomi who is a finance guy with a Fortune 500 company in the USA and his wife Priscilla who is an IT professional Now yesterday we saw Priscilla transition from an everyday wife who was having a squabble with her husband Julian to a woman standing on the promises of the Lord to save the life of this same husband the father of her two sons from what she described Julia and her husband went from minor heartburn which is what took them to the hospital and about an hour later not only had he suffered a full blown heart attack he had flatlined which means that his heart had stopped beating and for all intents and purposes He was dead. Julian's best friend, a cardiologist, Dr. Ayim Jamson, was present at the hospital. And after over 10 minutes of no response from Julian, he along with Priscilla broke out in tongues praying and pleading with God. And then they heard the sound that is music to every cardiologist's ears, the beep of life, the sound that his heart was back. proof that indeed the prayers of the righteous availeth much but all of this happened outside of the room where julian was today we get to hear from julian himself what was happening to him while the doctors were fighting to save his life and while his wife and his friend were praying for him julian take it away Yeah so on my on my end so once i got into the um emergency um you know the the they told me uh, how were asking how I was feeling and stuff like that and they said the doctor was going to come shortly the um the cardiologist so i was just laying down they they they, they put some drips and some certain things on me i don't know if they gave me an injection or you know to calm the pain but um you know I was just there you know and they were asking me questions here and then and the surgeon came sorry the doctor came and when the doctor came the doctor started asking me a few questions and then I blanked out mm-hmm. so that's when i believe my first f- flatline happened i had that I, i flatlined twice and i came back pretty quickly the first two times but it was the third time that i was gone for over 10 minutes no blood nothing you're, no you're dead blood no minutes. oxygen to the brain so i was gone for a while now what i remember at that point is i came out of my body so i could see my body on the on the operating table now the funny thing is i saw my body as it is you no know, big body on the on the operating table but the doctors and nurses in the room 
we're all very little. We're all very little in there. And it looks just like when you're in an airplane flying at 30,000 feet. You look down, you see all those, you know, little, little cars. cars and yeah. yeah, very similar to that, you know. But to be honest, I was so confused. I kept asking, I was like, what is this? The earth was so dark that it was not appealing to come back. You know, even if I knew how to come back, I didn't want to come back. You know, so I started moving towards this beautiful bright light, you know, and I believe that was the, that was heaven, you know, and I believe, you know, when in the Bible it says heaven's gate or something, I think that's what I was. So I started moving towards there when halfway God stopped me. Now, nobody introduced me to God. I knew immediately that that was God. Mm. And um, very, very difficult to explain in my human body, but God is just the same, just a bigger version, was a bigger version of me. And he kind of hugged me. Now, I'm using all these words because I'm in my human body and I know we have hands and heads and all this stuff. But out there, it was not like that. I know I was inside him. You know, and he just showed me the love he has for all of us. He showed me, he, you know, he, he told me that this love I have for you, that's the same love I have for the, for the poor, the uh, madman, the gay person, the poor man. You know, he, he just showed me basically that he loves everybody on it. All his, um, his, his kids. Could you physically feel him or what is it like? It was just so beautiful. Honestly, I mean, I could feel the love. I mean, and it's the kind of love that, you know, because Priscilla, when I came back, Priscilla kept asking me, you know, to, to kind of explain the, the love, you know. So, I mean, the only way I could explain it to her was when she started having kids, uh, our two boys, when they came out and the nurses put the baby on, the, on her chest, the love. Because I was there and I saw the love that she had for the little boys, right? I said, just multiply that by a million. That's the kind of love God has for us. Now, that was the first thing he said to me. But then once he, he, once he said that, that's when I asked for forgiveness. That's the first thing you that, asked. That's the first thing that came. I asked for forgiveness. I said, God, forgive me of all my sins. Then... I said to him that if this is what you call death, give me one more chance to make things right with Priscilla and the boys. Now, mind you, when I came out of my body, I never thought of Priscilla. I never thought of my boys, Matthew and Andrew. I never thought of my bank account. I never thought of my car. I never thought of my home. Nothing. I mean, everything about the world kind of vanished. So I kept, you know, wondering when I was in ICU, what made me think of Priscilla and the boys when I was with God? But later I came to find out that it was all the prayers. Mind you, all those that were praying were people that I knew personally that really loved me. Praying. So, you know, everybody's heart was into the prayer. What they were doing, yeah. You know, so... Uh, so that's when I asked God that give me one more chance and I want to make things right with Priscilla and the boys. And what you did know, he say? No, he, he never said anything. I said three things before he even spoke. So then I said to him, you know, and this was more like, I don't want to say demand, but I said to him, I said, I know you have a lot of work for me to do. Let me know what my purpose is and I promise I'm going to get that done. So once I finished saying those three things, that's when God said, son, and he always referred to me as son. He said, son, I anoint you. That was the first thing. He anointed me. I anoint you. He says, I'm going to make you whole. Then he also said to me that I have a very pure heart. If you think about it, make me whole from what? But he said, when God speaks, you accept it as it is. I mean, there was no question as to ask him questions. What do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? Right. No, no. It was when he speaks, that's it. 
Then he said to me that all I want you to do is to spread your testimony. Then he said to me that if I decide to spread my testimony through writing a book or a movie, he doesn't want me to benefit not even a cent out of that. He wants me to give every single money I make to the poor. And he, specific, he specifically said a movie and a book. He said movie and he a book. He didn't say WhatsApp. He didn't no, say. no, no. WhatsApp never came. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he says, if I decide to do that, I need to give everything to the poor. Funny enough, he also said to me that he doesn't want me to be a pastor. Basically, he, was, he wanted me to focus, spread your testimony. He says, your testimony is going to bring a lot of souls to me. Okay. He, then he said, as a matter of fact, 90% of churches in the world is not present. Nine, zero. So basically, if you're driving down the road and you see 10 churches, he's only one. He's only one. You know, it says churches are now a business. So I listened to him and then I said to him that, well, if that is the case, I wouldn't speak in those churches. He says, son, those are the churches I want you to speak at. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you know, you know, and then, um, you know, once he anointed me again and then I was back in my body. How much time was this? In, in, in I, I'm know, not saying in the world, but for you, as it appeared to you, how right. much time was it? Felt like I was with God for at least a day. But when I came back, I was gone for over 10 minutes. Max 12. But to me, it felt like 24 hours. But I don't know. You know, we are outside of time. Time yes. really doesn't mean anything, yeah. you know, when you're there. So, so, I, so I don't know. So, I, 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 so, so when, you, when you came back, all this time you're talking to God, what's the language we're using here? That's a very good question. So I never spoke English with God. Everything was a feeling, right? So once I came back into my body and I got consciousness, I came back. I was, you know, I said everything was done and I, that's when everything downloaded into English. You know, there were only three things, when I came back, only three things that I remembered, right? But as the days went in ICU, God kept revealing more things that we discussed. When he revealed one thing, you know, apart from the first three that I remembered, when he revealed the fourth, he always started from the first, second, third, then he talked about the fourth. When he was bringing something new, he went back, started from the first, second, third, fourth, then fifth. The sixth time, the sixth one, he went from the first. He, he reminded me from the beginning to the um, now. He spoke to me through thoughts or dreams, but he always made a human being confirm it the next day. The very next day. The very next day. No more than 24 hours. A human being called, confirmed it. So you could have called and through conversation, you say something that he had just told me about. And that so I that know confirms, that's him. Yeah. What were those first three things that you remembered? So the first three things was his anoint, him anointing me, him talking about me having a pure heart, and, um, oh yeah, he loves everybody. Those were the first three things that I remember. So, yeah. you know, you talk about having a pure heart and all of this, and I, I'm sure the question our listeners have is, why you? Are you some cliche boy? I mean, what was your story? You see, I was the naughtiest boy you could, you could think of. <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't a, a spiritual person. You know, yeah, we, I mean, my wife made sure that we went to church every Sunday. I was, you know, I wasn't any, um, I wasn't any, I was just a normal guy. Normal guy that parties and does everything that a normal guy does. Now, I think, you know, I think God used me because he feels I'll be able to communicate better with, with his people. 
Because you're just like them. Because I'm just like everybody. Yeah. A, 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 like, a, what's it called? Like, the average Joe. You know? So, God says you make you whole. Right. You come back, your chest has been opened. What was the work that was done on you while you were in hospital? So, and I think Priscilla will be able to explain better, but okay. from what I hear, you know, there were three ways to open the artery that was blocked. The first one was to try and just open it, try and, you know, open the artery. Push something by, through. Push something tube, yeah. through. And the second one was by using a stent, you know, to open it. And the last one was an open heart. Surgery. Right. Okay. Now, apparently, the first two didn't work. So, you are experiencing the first two not working, Priscilla. Yes. So, what yes. happened? What was the process? So, um, what happened there was he had to be um, airlifted from Howard County General to John Hopkins. John Hopkins is well known for cardiovascular. They specialize with um, heart surgery. Okay. Um, so at this point, had they tried the, to push something through to open it? Or? They had tried to open it as soon as he came back to his body, as okay. he's saying. Immediately, they started trying to open the artery, and that was at the first hospital. Okay. And um, they actually said that they weren't equipped to do it, so mm-hmm. he had to be transported. And that time was of the essence and everything, so they said they were going to airlift him. Then come to find out that that day of all days, the weather wasn't going to permit them to fly. At this point, they said he's going to have to go by ambulance, you know. And so they brought a stack of papers for me to fill out so that because the liability now yeah, is yeah, huge. Yeah. Um, so, so again, you know, we're going, God, really, what is this? It feels like <laughs> It feels like you're definitely doing something because everything man is doing is not working. He's supposed to be airlifted now. We're taking him by ambulance. You're dealing with traffic. You're dealing with bumps along the road. And in the paperwork, it basically said that that they're not going to be liable and that this is a high-risk transportation. By air, how long is the the flight? Five minutes. Five minutes. And how long is it by road? 45 minutes. And with traffic, could have been an hour. And yet time is of the essence. essence. Nice. Okay. Yes. (laughs) But in my my case, it took two and a half hours. Yes. Yes. What? Because, yeah, they had to use a specialized ambulance because I was on a lot of life support machines. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they needed a special ambulance that could have, that equipped to carry all those things. And also they needed doctors, not EMT guys, but actual doctors in case anything happens on route. On the road, yes. Two yeah. and a half hours. Yes. So are you following the ambulance? Did you, did you follow the ambulance to Johns Hopkins? Yes. Well, I went. I actually went home to make sure the kids were okay because mm-hmm. I, I knew he was on route. That was my thought was, you told me time is of the essence, so I, I know you're on route. Um, so I just tended to the kids, left them with my younger brother, their uncle. And um, Aim also, Aim and Nina followed along. So Aim and Nina actually got there before I did. And when I got there... They said Julian still wasn't there. So now I'm frantically calling Howard County General. Where is he? You guys told us that time is of the essence. And and basically, the the artery that you were able to open up slightly was just for just a short amount. And he could, he could go again. So they're like, they're on their way. They're coming. So it actually took about two hours before Julian arrived. So we all arrived in the waiting room before he even got there. Wow. So again... Unheard of, yeah. you know, unheard of. So so I'll fast forward to the point where he was talking about. So each time the surgeon would come out and speak to us, and it was myself, Dr. Jamson, and his wife, Nina. And we were sitting in the na- waiting room, and they would come out and explain all the options that he had, they, they, they could do. And each time they would come, I would refer to Aim, you know, is this the right way? You know, what, what do you think? Because he's got the expertise. And along each way, he's like, yeah, you know, opening the artery makes perfect sense. You know, they're going to try that. They come back and they said there was too much plaque buildup. And again, I'm not a medical person. So that was a no-go. So then they go back again. And then another hour or two to try and put a stent in. They come back, no-go. Last absolute last thing they can do is open heart surgery. And at this point, I look over at Aim because... I'm used to looking to him for confirmation. Are they doing the right thing? And Aim has turned his face away from me. And Nina, his wife, has also done the same, you know, kind of holding her husband. So now I'm sitting there and the surgeon is talking to me. And he's so saying you're by that yourself. I'm by myself. 
So the surgeon's talking to me, and he says that this this man has been through a lot since, if you remember, since six a.m. Yeah, they've been working on him, shocking him, CPR, opening his artery, putting a stent in, and that he had already he had been through so much that they even thought that he wouldn't make it through surgery from the shock of of what they and had. They to shocked do. me over twenty times. Yeah. Yes. 20 times? 20. Yes. Don't they normally give up after like three or four times? Yeah, I think in Maryland it's six times a max, but it did over 20. Because Dr. Jamson was back there sh- shouting, <laughs> shock him, shock him. And I think they were like, you know what? <laughs> wow. So, yes. so yes. three possible procedures. Yes. Two have failed. Two have we failed. We are now to, to let's the last open one. his chest. To where now even Dr. Jamson is not yeah he was he, he had on his medical hat and he he knew so i'm looking at the surgeon and you know and i said well what alternative do we have and he said well you know in some instances some people let their loved one go at this point truth is i'm tired options are few i'm trying to pray but where are you? I'm all church down, hurt and abused. I can't pray what's left to do. Come, truth is, I'm weak, no strength to fight. No tears to cry. Our devotion for today will focus on Luke chapter 4, verse 16 to 21. At the beginning of his earthly ministry, the Bible tells us that Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, and set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of God. Indeed, this scripture is fulfilled in our hearing. The testimony of Julian shows us that God is not inconsistent within himself. His supernatural revelations of himself, as Julian experienced, are not inconsistent with how he has revealed himself to us in his word. Like Jesus, each of us has been anointed to proclaim good news to the poor. And the fact that we may not have met God in a supernatural encounter like Julian does not excuse us from that duty. Each of us has been called to do something for the poor, for the prisoner for the blind, for the person who is bound up in an alternate lifestyle. We are the body of Christ, and therefore everything that Christ did on earth, we are required to continue. But unfortunately, most of us have resolved to take care of ourselves and no one else. It is my prayer that as we have listened to this testimony, it will force us to re-examine ourselves and our lives. What are our priorities? How aligned are our priorities with the priorities of God? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your word says to us in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that we should not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of our minds. Lord, today you have reminded us through the testimony of your Son, of the things that your Son the Lord Jesus Christ himself said that your heart is with the poor. Your heart is with the disenfranchised. 
Your heart is with those who suffer. And yet the world, the things of the world, have caused us to believe that our priorities must be with what we can earn, what we can have, what we can hold, what we can see. Lord, as you have reminded us today, help us to start to align our priorities with your priorities. Help us to see that you do not give us just so we can keep for ourselves. But just as when you were feeding the 5,000, you gave to the disciples, the disciples gave to the people. Teach us, Lord, to give to the people. Teach us not to hoard. Teach us not to be so preoccupied with gathering that that becomes the be-all and end-all of our lives. We thank you for this testimony that you have brought home for us. We know there are many in the world who you are using to remind us of what your word says. As you have chosen to use this son of this land, may it ring true for us that your word is truth and your word is life. Keep us true to our calling and to our purpose, Father. In your son Jesus Christ's name we've prayed. Amen. Take me to the king I don't have much to bring My heart's torn in pieces It's my offering Lay me at the throne Leave me there alone To gaze upon your glory And sing Thank you for staying with us. And if you just tuned in, you are listening to The Word, the morning devotion of Asasi Radio 99.5. I am Reverend Ikua. And I'd like to thank you for beginning your day with us and in the Word of God. The essence of this show is for us to explore the Word of God. And so if you have any questions or thoughts, something about Scripture that you don't quite understand, and you want to know what it means in the Word of God, send us a WhatsApp message at 054-541-1414. That number again is 054-541-1414. And when you do send that message, please make sure that you include your name and where you are writing from so we can credit the sermon to you. Again, the number is 054-541-1414. I'd like to say thank you to my producer, Abed Edubwahin, and my studio technician, Stephen. And to you, I pray that God will watch over you throughout the day and bring you back every Sunday through to Thursday at 5 a.m., to explore the word of God. Until then, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace and the blessing of God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you, remain with you, guide you, keep you, and protect you now and forevermore. Amen. I'll now hand you over to Kweku Inshira Adu for the Asasi Breakfast Show. God bless you and bye-bye. May the grace of God surround you. May His light direct your path. May His Spirit lead and guide you. As the weeks and months go past May your soul be blessed And may your joy be full Of the love that heals like rings As you obey his call Remember most You're a child.